this is really important for this area of work because it becomes one of our fundamental fundamental rights and how do we approach this um, both at a personal level and on a legal level so I'm really excited to have Jeff speak for us um, Jeff studied philosophy at the Amherst College where he f founded the first club of the human potential movement he also graduated from law school at the University of Arizona with the intention of fighting to change the laws so that they're more in line with the actualization of this human potential. Uh, he also started in our PCC program last fall. That's PCC stands for Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness. It's a program here at CIS. And uh, I'm really excited to hear what he has to say. So a big round of applause for Jeff. Thank you. Good evening. So yeah, my talk is titled Cognitive Liberty and Entheogenic Freedom. Um, just to give you a little quick background on what cognitive liberty is, um, and in particular how it has to do with entheogenic freedom, there are usually two different sides to cognitive liberty. One is the ability to alter, augment, or achieve any sort of state of consciousness you, you desire without any sort of interference. The other uh, negative side is that so no one can alter your own consciousness or affect your cognition without your consent. So the second one has actually been worked on a lot and we have a lot of pretty good laws um, in place to protect us from from that but the positive law of cognitive liberty to be able to augment our consciousness and do what we uh, feel is in our best for our well, best well-being and to explore consciousness um, these laws unfortunately are not being protected. Um, in fact most laws are very much against this. So here's what I hope to achieve um, with this talk. Um, first, I want to discuss why cognitive liberty should be recognized as a basic human right. Talk about why entheogens should not be outlawed. More so, I'm going to argue that entheogenic use should be protected by the Constitution. I'm going to give reasons why I think this is important. And then I'm going to present some legal arguments that maybe can be made to support this in court in the future. So first, one of the founding principles of this country was self-determination, autonomy, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, the definition of self-determination, or one, is the process by which an individual controls her own life. Our actions are up to us without interference. Now, as you can tell, with our current laws the way they are, we can't simply take entheogens whenever we'd like to. So, our self-determination is very limited in a very explicit way. Now, self-determination doesn't mean that you can do anything. What it does mean, though, is that you can pretty much do anything as long as it doesn't infringe on anyone else's rights, on anyone else's ability to self-determine and be autonomous. Um, and I'm going to argue that entheogens do not in any way infringe on other people's rights. If anything, they sometimes make us more aware of other people's rights and maybe even ecological rights. Um, the United Nations s quoted that the self-determination is an integral part of basic human rights. So if we're going to be able to self-determine in the most important way, determine our own minds, that needs to be one of the most fundamental basic human rights. Our forefathers sought to protect self-determination and freedom and autonomy of the individual and tried to make sure that no laws could be made to the contrary. So unfortunately, there seems to have been some regression and I don't think they would be very happy about this. Um, so just a question to ponder on your, in your own minds while we go through this. How much autonomy and freedom do we really have? You know, we say we live in the most free country in the world even though we have the most incarcerated citizens per capita. And, but you know, it's, uh, just think about it. How much autonomy do we really have? If we don't have the autonomy of our own mind, of our own consciousness, of our own states of being, of how we experience the world, then are we really free? free? Do we really have autonomy? Um, one one uh, analogy I like to make is with abortion rights. Um, you know, many of you have heard the slogan, my body, my choice. Well, I think it should also be my mind, my choice. Another argument, other than the self-determination and autonomous argument that can be made, is the argument of privacy. Um, many of you might not know, but in Texas, until 2006, it was illegal um, to ha sodomy was illegal even in the privacy of one's own home. So in 2006, ruling from si six to three of the judges voted that uh, because it was in the privacy of their own home, and because there's nothing more personal and private than sexual activity, the government does not have the right to stick their nose in it where it doesn't belong. <laughs> now, basically, I would like to extend this argument to spirituality. 
um, and for uh, psych psychonauts and for people wanting to explore their own minds, their own consciousness, and the spiritual dimension of reality. I think there's nothing more personal, private, or intimate than this, so I can see why the 14th Amendment should be extended to protect privacy of entheogenic use in one's own home. Um, you know, and unfortunately, <laughs> instead of that, we're being threatened to be put in prison instead. So there just seems to be a really backwards uh, kind of coloring to our law right now that, in my opinion, makes us uh, live in a mental prison. So another thing that this doesn't um, allow is freedom of experience. So with different entheogens, obviously there are different realms of experience and people have many new experiences oftentimes. By making these experiences illegal, what they're basically doing is saying, you can live all of these ways, but if you want to experience these little things here, sorry, you can't do that. They're not allowed. It's uh, walled off to you by the government. Graham Hancock calls this a war on consciousness, saying that only certain states of consciousness are allowed, and any other states basically are uh, threat they're threatening t imprisonment. And um, I'll uh, make an analogy to the Inquisition a little bit later, which I think um, provides a lot of insight. Um, so one other thing that's really important is that we can only think about things that we've experienced. So if we can't experience certain states of consciousness and the thoughts and ideas that come with them, then we really can't think about them. So not having this freedom of experience also makes it so that we don't have freedom of thought. And freedom of thought was one of the most important principles that the founders of this country wanted to protect. The Center for Cognitive Liberty and Ethics says that their mission, and it's, they argue, like I said, is protected by the First Amendment, is freedom of thought. They say freedom of thought is what the whole cognitive liberty movement is about, and they're what could be more important than freedom of thought. Um, they took a quote from a case, Palco v. Connecticut, in 1937, which shows that the judicial branch also agrees that freedom of thought is one of the most important principles to protect. It says, freedom of thought is the matrix, the indispensable condition of nearly every other form of freedom. With rare aberrations, a pervasive recognition of this truth can be traced in our history, political and legal. Constraining or they also say, constraining or sensory, how a person thinks, which is called cognitive censorship, is the most fundamental kind of censorship and is contrary to some of the most cherished constitutional principles. Thomas Roberts, he's a philosopher um, out of Chicago, he says that psychedelics are what he calls quote unquote ideogens. An ideogen means something that creates new ideas that otherwise you wouldn't have had access to. Um, I'll be discussing it more, but given our current ecological crisis and many of the problems that we're facing now, realizing that the old way of thinking and the old way of doing things is not going to solve the problem, we're really in need of some new ideas. So making these psychedelics or ideogens illegal seems to really be stifling our potential for evolution and, um, and collective harmony. Um, an example of how psychedelics can be ideogens, these are just some examples of uh, new ideas that have come about through psychedelics. Uh, transpersonal psychology, who um, Graf obviously was uh, one of the founders of. Personal computers and the internet came about from the psychedelic, re <laughs> psychedelic revolution. Francis and Crick uh, claimed that they discovered the double helix on an LSD trip. And actually, there was just news in the CNN recently, I don't know if anyone caught it, but they're um, talking t with interviewing different people in Silicon Valley who are working right now. And they basically said when they get up into a programming idea, that, um, a programming problem that they can't figure out, they kind of hit like a roadblock. What they do is they basically all get together, take usually psilocybin, I think they said, but an entheogen together and try to help figure out the problem. And they said it's extremely successful most of the time, which <laughs> given this evidence uh, of these other evidence isn't, isn't very surprising. Now, I want to get into freedom of speech, also another extension of the First Amendment, um, because like I said, we need freedom of thought, but why, all, why is freedom of thought so important other than just the ability to think anything and think whatever we want in that so, sort of self-determinative way? It's important because we can only talk about what we can think about. And therefore, if you're branching off certain experiences and therefore branching off certain thoughts, you're also branching off certain language and certain words that need to be present in the public dialogue. 
Now, censorship needs to stop in order for the public dialogue to be truly free and uncensored. The courts have often said that there is no, quote unquote, no final arbiter of truth. And what that means is, is that there's no God in this guy or someone that has a perspective above everyone else that can, that can prove that he has objective knowledge. And therefore, there needs to be free, open discourse and dialogue in the public so that all ideas have a place and that so the best ideas will flourish and move forward, or at least democratically speaking, hopefully. Um, so th this, uh, not having this freedom of speech actually already has effects, really detrimental effects in the medical field and in medical schools. For instance, how often in, the, in medical schools are people being taught about sacred medicines or entheogens as viable ways to treat all sorts of potential harms and sicknesses? They're not. And you know, a lot, I'll get into it a little bit later, but a lot of evidence, I think many of you know, I'm probably preaching to the choir, um, know that entheogens have a lot of healing modalities and a lot of healing potential with a lot less side effects than most pharmaceuticals. So the fact that it's very clear that in the medical dialogue, entheogens don't have any sort of position or presence that the freedom of speech is not really free. There's a huge, huge area that is being completely suppressed. So we want true freedom of speech, and for that, cog sorry, we want true freedom of speech, and for that, cognitive liberty is required. So I'm going to discuss now censorship of knowledge and try to convince you that this is similar to kind of a second inquisition. So like Galileo, um, who was imprisoned in the Inquisition in the early 1600s because he was espousing the heliocentric view of the universe. Um, the church basically tried to suppress this knowledge. It was against the teachings. It was against the mainstream view. And threatened with imprisonment, or even worse, anyone who was trying to gain knowledge by continuing the scientific research. In similar ways, in, in the 70s, people who were doing psychedelic research and entheogenic research were also threatened with imprisonment if they continued to do their research. And even nowadays, there's been a little bit of progress, but it's still really hard to get approval to do these studies. And with the regulations the way it is, it's just not as free and gaining as much steam as it needs to because of these strict, strict regulations. And that's just for research, for personal use or for um, exploring one's own self, you know, there's still obviously the threat of imprisonment, which seems so backwards. Censoring new ways of seeing and information is what's happening right now, just like it happened back in Galileo's day. With Galileo, he was using a telescope to see this new information. With us, we're using entheogens and psychedelics to, to learn our new information. And just like the telescope and all the information that came with it would have been really detrimental if it didn't enter the public sphere, the same thing has to do with entheogens. Entheogens are a tool, and with them we can have access to new information that otherwise we wouldn't have had access to. And because of that, without psychedelics, this information, just like the heliocentric universe, will not be accepted into the mainstream and won't be... Um, it won't be integrated as part of our new world view and way of living. So who does this knowledge threaten? In particular, threatens a lot of really big institutions or collective institutions, religious literalists. And what I mean by that is anyone who, doesn't anyone who thinks direct experience of the divine is heresy, materialistic scientism, big pharma, which I mentioned earlier, they do not want psychedelics around because you can't make money off them. It's not something you get dependent on. It's not something that you need to buy all the time. And obviously it's a huge, uh, huge <coughs> threat to our current socioeconomic and political structures which are full of materialism, commodity fet fetishism, and the like. So the new eyes for new solutions. Just like in Silicon Valley, where these ideogens can aid in solving problems, in our day too, for the problems we have, these ideogens can help us solve their problems. But unlike computer programming, I think entheogens actually have a lot more of an organic relationship and specifically apply to our current plight. So, for instance, um, it allows us to deconstruct and analyze our current cultural norms and practices to fix social maladies. 
be able to see, uh, like the past speaker was saying, all humans and beings as one giant family allows us to transcend our ethnocentrism and our anthropocentrism, hopefully. But also, more specifically, and how it relates really clearly, is our ecological crisis. Through psychedelic use and entheogens, people realize that the Earth is a living organism and that we are parts or holons of it. We are not simply masters that have dominion over it. It allows us to get in touch with our shadow and, and repress aspects of our psyche, in particular, socially, the divine feminine, in which our patriarchal system has completely suppressed, if not com worse. To stop the manipulation of Gaia, as if she were simply a hollow, insignificant matter to be used for our pleasure and also the oppressions of women in general. I think all of these have in common releasing the stronghold of patriarchy and materialism, which I think entheogens allow you to recover these aspects of yourself and recover these aspects of reality. Um, so they also allow us to live in the mystery and to create new myths. And in this program, and philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness anyway, many of us have been working to create new myths. And um, this is something that is uh, really exciting and that entheogens can help us work with because they put us in this mythic realm. Um, just to give a little personal account of, my, of how entheogens were significant to me, um, personally, I was just this, you know, robot, guy who wanted to make a lot of money and be materialist and saw this as just stuff. Um, but with different entheogenic experiences, I realized that the earth was an or a live organism of which I'm a large, a larger organism of which I'm a part. It gave me respect for all different aspects of reality and people and animals and even inanimate objects. Um, I realized through MDMA that I, I was the source of unconditional love and that we're all the source of unconditional love and helped to reclaim my feminine. And um, it helped me deconstruct my own behavior and to see the flaws in our current system. And it allowed me to be more at peace and find meaning and significance in life. So now they talk about the right to sacred medicine, which is, we're not even allowed to use this as medicine. We're allowed to use opiates, for instance. You can get that all the time, but to have a psychedelic as a medicine, that's not allowed. Instead, it's punishable by prison. That just seems crazy to me. Um, so when current medications are so ineffective, full of side effects, this is tyranny and criminality at its very peak. Medical evidence supports the efficacy of entheogens, like I said, MDMA for post-traumatic stress, psilocybin for cancer patients who are experiencing anxiety because they're afraid of death. Um, these, these are Ibogaine and ayahuasca for, op for uh, opiate addiction. It's crazy that they allow opiates to be prescribed, but to help with the opiate addiction, no, that's not allowed, sorry. It begins not allowed, just, just what gets you addicted. Um, how much can a person really pursue happiness, which our founding fathers wanted us to, if we can't even pursue effective medical treatment? So this is tyranny and censorship, and it must end. Cognitive states which promote the economic system are promoted while others are outlawed. This is a war on consciousness, and therefore most of us that, and most of us don't even realize that this is actually taking place. I understand people here do, which is great. Cognitive liberty may be the crucial right now because it's inextricable from each moment of our lives and our current problems. Perhaps if we do, and we are able to achieve new ways of seeing, we can work collaboratively and transform our society from a cancer on Gaia into what we truly are, her symbiotic children. Now, one last quote. Our forefathers, when they claimed independence, understood the power of the individual, the value of self-determination. They freed us from tyranny. They had to fight to secure their freedom. Now we have to fight to secure our freedom and our salvation. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much, Jeff. Awesome talk. Awesome talk. If anyone has any questions, please raise your hand. So what do we do? How do we <laughs> fight? Um, so there are, few, there are good organizations to look into that you could be part of. One I mentioned here, the CLCC. The other is obviously MAPS, um, the DPA, Drug Policy Alliance, the Hefter Institute. These are all great organizations that are um, working to solve this problem, and they could definitely use a lot of help if you contact them. Most of them are really, really open to it. I did an internship for the DPA uh, one summer, and it was great. Um, obviously also uh, normal, kind of, but... Um, and, uh, you know, honestly, you can go to city council meetings, and you can, you know, 
give your view. You can say why you think that this is wrong and unconstitutional. Um, me being a lawyer who hopefully going to be in court, I can maybe do so a little bit more formally, but they definitely listen to, you know, normal citizens. So that's part of it. I think also part of it is, is um, spreading the awareness a little bit. Um, but that's, just, uh, I guess, that, that would be my answer. I think that was a great presentation. Um, I had a clarifying question, I guess. Sure. Uh, philosophically, I do agree that consciousness expansion should be something that's not even considered to be illegal. It shouldn't be a legal question. As far as the reality goes, uh, when you look at the fact that mescaline-containing cacti are legal and psilocybin-producing mushroom spores are legal and DMT-containing plant, you know, they're legal, to what degree is this really a, a problem or an impediment versus... I think it's um, a large problem, first of all, when it deals with research. Um, because what doctors are going to want to risk anything to go to jail just, you know, to do their research when it actually could be helping a lot of people? And then I think also um, with myself, I know that, you know, just because I don't have... It's not about having access. It's about... Um, it's, it's about multiple things. But it's not only about having access. It's about... Um, being able to take it and have these experiences without the threat of imprisonment on it, without the negative stigma against it, without people in society thinking it's a negative thing. It would be great if society was supporting these sorts of ventures, supporting this type of growth, supporting this type of exploration. And I think changing the laws will change sort of the public image and the public consensus about how to view these things. I think that's what's most important is that there needs to be a worldview change into how we view psychedelics, not um, our ability to acquire them. Any other questions? Yes, right here. Oops. Um, I'm just wondering uh, your take on the the level of allowing the use of entheogens, like, um, isn't it, I mean, it is a strong medicine, and it's really kind of not for everybody. I mean, if you're borderline psychotic, maybe, or whatever. So, right. you know, wouldn't it be something where a step, the best we could hope for would be, uh, you know, controlled use? Like, there's got to be rules, like, no driving, you know? Mm -hmm. Right, while you're using, for sure. And, and then not for everybody, maybe go through a psychologist or something to get a prescription. Right, right. I didn't have time in this talk, but um, what I wanted, one thing I was going to talk about were um, different ways because you know so with freedom comes responsibility and so with this new freedom of our own co on our own cognitive um, consciousness and our ability to augment it comes responsibility like you're saying um, so one idea I had was sort of like a driver's license you go and you get sort of training you take a test and if you get your license and you can sort of be in your own home and and or in a, uh, a you know a uh, the Santo Daime church for instance or something like that and use these substances in a in a in a safe and uh, a safe setting that isn't really going to infringe on anyone else's right to self determine their lives um, but that's definitely something and there you know in some women there's a MD for MDMA right now there are some people that are actually having people come to do to take medicine with and to work them through it different psychologists so I think um, it would be a huge step in it and amazing and I would probably be happy if it, you could go to a psychologist and and go through an experience like this or get a license and do such a thing I often hold on uh, we're, we're here and then we have a question over here but I just want to make a brief comment um, I often also wonder like what types of experiences will happen in a world where we don't have to have that little yeah. seed in the back of our head like right. we might get we might get arrested yeah or totally. just something might happen like, totally would, would, in, would integration be less needed perhaps because now people mm. wouldn't have these really challenging mm. experiences probably not of course but mm. you, you wonder how much of an effect does this legal situation have on our own right personal and especially in these states we're so sensitive that it's going to affect us so much more than it you know it's funny, I, um, I thought about asking a question. I didn't know there was a mind reader in the room already. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I was uh, listening to the radio. Um, someone had written a book about the First Amendment, or is it the Second Amendment? Correct me if I'm wrong. With the freedom of thought, speech. First. Right. It showed my ignorance that I didn't know that freedom of thought was the first freedom in the, the First Amendment. Um, 
And, and then it went on to talk about how the freedom to, of speech in a way has been co-opted by uh, the corporate world because again it's something that actually can be uh, monetized, um, commodified, right? A thought is more difficult to monetize, commodify. And so it hasn't, you know, speech has then become the moniker for all the freedoms but then it's also one that can be manipulated. But I'm wondering if you've thought about how uh, the anthogenic uh, adventure could be nevertheless co-opted given the strength and sort of dominance of that system. If that's something that you're considering when you're considering like freedom of thought, freedom of use. Um, so can that, was, you, that can was the thought I wasn't going to ask. But what it, the, uh, Can you just clarify really quick if sure. uh, freedom of thought should be in, in the support of when you're when you're thinking about how what your vision is for freedom of thought, which is really freedom of being, right? Are you thinking about some like problematizing that as well? You know, if a person can be a corporation, mm -hmm. um, how does that factor into the movement into articulating, conceptualizing, envisioning a free world? Um, yeah, just. Um, I don't see, um, you know, I don't, I don't see really how that would have any sort of um, effect or uh, negative impact on the free open discourse. Um, unfortunately, you know, corporations actually have more rights than people right now. Um, and uh, yeah, I just don't, I mean, that's something that, you know, is sort of a separate issue that needs to sort of be addressed, but I don't see it pertaining directly to, um, making any problem for freedom of being or freedom of thought. Um, unless you can maybe offer one in particular I can maybe respond to. Um, yes, I'm, I'm thinking about how uh, money is power. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, even if, there, even if the discourse kind of like changes, mm -hmm. I see what you're saying through through media and things like that. Who I see what you're saying. Um, so you know, usually, you know, it, sometimes it takes the right idea some time to finally gain recognition and to finally come out. A lot of times, geniuses aren't recognized in their days; they're recognized later for their ideas. And I think that that actually, you know, might be something to uh, to stifle it. Like actually, I think you make a good point, but I think in the long run, in the long run, these really important ideas and the medical and therapeutic benefits of these substances are going to be obvious and are just going to eventually prevail because you know the truth always does, and um, I think that uh, you know. Uh, once the, all the stigma and the laws against this stuff also are changed, there's not really going to be feel the need for the people in control or the money people to really want to, you know, be against it because they sort of, I think, want to because they're trying to be um, the epitome of what a successful whatever, you know, uh, American is and they want to be accepted and loved in the mainstream and by making themselves seem radical that they can't do that. So I think as the discourse evolves and as it becomes more accepted, so will people's views, even even the rich and the money, people with the money. But then again, that's just a hope, so we'll see. <laughs> Thank you very much for the talk. Um, what about deregulation? I know in our home state recently a conservative uh, lawmaker proposed uh, marijuana be treated as a vegetable and be totally deregulated. So we're starting to see conservative arguments for deregulation to try to maybe win back votes. But hmm. what about deregulation in the context of the law here? Um, I would be, you know, I, I think I would actually be for that. I think there's risks um, li like this gentleman has brought up that, you know, kind of a free-for-all can have a lot of negative effects and casualties, especially given the context societally, socially that we're in right now. Um, but, you know, with things, um, 
Complete deregulation, I think, would actually be a step forward, but it might actually be a step too far. And I think, like I said, with freedom comes responsibility. And I think that in order to use these things responsibly, unfortunately, you need to be educated. You aren't just born with the knowledge of how to use these things. So I think there needs to be some sort of education, some sort of indoc indoctrination, some sort of um, induction into this in order to be able to, to use these substances in a really practical, therapeutic, and beneficial way. That being said, I didn't have that, and I feel like I got a lot out of them. So, <laughs> so deregulation, I guess I would be for it at this point, especially because it would bring a lot of awareness, too. Uh, my, my question is along these same lines. I think we're, we're kind of stuck here uh, about how much freedom is, um, uh, how much freedom are we asking for? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I struggle with this, this issue of uh, the medical model coming in and dominating the research and on the one hand we always like to say I say it too that this is progress this is some you know steps in the right direction because we're doing research and we weren't doing research 15 20 years ago mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand one of the, th the things that your talk really brought home for me <clears throat> when we talk about freedom of thought all this research that's going on dominated by the medical model and the government I don't think they could care less about freedom of thought it's all mm -hmm. uh, symptom alleviation, which is important, right. but it sure isn't what we're talking about here. Right. And I wonder, you know, just to sort of let myself get really paranoid for a moment, you know, sure. kind of play devil's advocate with this, I, you know, <clears throat> maybe we're kind of du allowing ourselves to be duped into this notion that progress is being made hmm. because <clears throat> they're really not taking it to that level. Right. And so I don't know what the question is there, but... <laughs> Well, I can respond a little bit um, to the second point. I think as the meta, uh, there are some great researchers doing this work anyway. So I think as these results come out, they're going to be more and more, the more and more difficult to ignore. And as they become more difficult to ignore, I think um, patients and people will be um, challenging their doctors. You know, well, how come I don't have access to this? Um, so that could help. But um, also, it doesn't really matter constitutionally whether or not they care about freedom of thought. That's the whole point of the Constitution was that it's supposed to protect us in the future always, no matter what, it's supposed to have certain protections for the individual in place that the government, no one can take away. So it's not supposed to really matter what they think. It's not even matters what 99.9% .9 think. As long as the judicial branch interprets the Constitution to say there should be freedom of thought, then there's going to be. Um, Thank you very much, Jeff. Really appreciate it. Thank you.